tonight. Magic beat tactics, lotto winner still unclaimed, and Waikato Regional Council spatial plan. Kia ora and good evening. Welcome to Central News on TV Central for Monday the 23rd of March. I'm Amanda Harper. In today's news, no rescue services available meant a pair of Tauranga firefighters had to think on their feet to help rescue two men swept away by strong currents near Maungatapu Bridge yesterday afternoon. Tauranga Fire Brigade senior firefighter Tim Pearce used a surfboard borrowed from a passerby to help rescue the two men. They, the firefighters also broke into nearby resident and senior firefighter Brendan Dunn's shed to use his kayak. Tauranga Fire Brigade Senior Station Officer Len Sabin says it was an unusual situation where there wasn't anyone available on the water to help. He says during the response, Maritime New Zealand and Tauranga Coast Guard were contacted, but Coast Guard didn't have any boats available and the police chopper was still on its way. They say a man entered the water to rescue a dog that had been swept out, followed by a second member of the public who saw the incident unfolding. The dog made it back to shore unaided. Delays expected on Western Bay of Plenty Roads as a major reseal program continues on the Tauranga Eastern Link. Motorists are urged to take care on the roads and allow extra time, especially on State Highway 29 between Tauranga and the Kaimai Summit and State Highway 36 between Tauranga and Rotorua this coming week. Speed restrictions of 30 kilometres an hour and stop-go traffic management will be in place at various state highway sites where delays of between 5 and 15 minutes are possible. We will post more details on where to allocate more travelling time between the cities of our regions on our Facebook page. Magic defeated the tactics 52-49 on the weekend in Hamilton. Kia Waikato Bay of Plenty Magic were forced to fend off a late charging mainland tactics before prevailing 52-49 and posting their second win of the season on Sunday. Facing a New Zealand team for the first time this campaign, the Magic made a frolicking start with slick through court play and accurate finishing to leave their southern visitors grappling for a reply. To their credit, the tactics recovered admirably from a 10-goal deficit to leave the ma Magic wearily looking over their shoulder. The visitors made a forceful rear guard comeback, going on to win the second half, but both coaches were left concerned at the high number of turnovers committed by their respective teams. With just a one-goal lead midway through the final stanza, Magic turned on some big defence while retaining cool heads on attack to eventually pocket the points. Magic have now won two from four outings, while the tactics remain winless. Jamie McDowell has announced her first ever nationwide tour to start this April this year. It will be the chance for many of her fans to see her closer to home as the tour heads all, all over the country for two months. In celebration of the release of her new album, Ask Me Anything, Jamie says she's thrilled to be going out on the road for the first time, making stops in t towns she has never performed in and getting to meet the fans that continue to inspire her music. She will be performing in The Mount on April 25th and in Hamilton on May the 8th at the Medial Theatre. She also makes a stop off in Te Aumotu on Sunday the 10th of May. And now for a special look at our favourite New Zealand music artist. A $2 million lotto winning ticket sold in Papamoa is yet to be claimed after Saturday night's draw. The first division win was a first for Pack and Save Papamoa's lotto counter and a huge excitement for the staff. Lotto Communications Manager Katie Atkins said last night the winners had not yet come forward but thought that they might leave town to claim their win. 
Pack and save Papamoa owner Rob McGregor was excited to hear of the win, the biggest in the store's four and a half year history. And now for our region's weather. Hamilton finds spells, few showers with light winds, high of 23 and low of 10. The rest of the Waikato the same, Pairo your high is 22 and 12, Matamata 22 high and low of 12, Te Aumotu 23 and 10, Tokoroa 20 high and 10 low. And in the Bay of Plenty, Tauranga finds spells with a few showers and light winds, 22 high and 14 low. Tupuki, your high is 20 and low of 14. And for the marine forecast, West Coast Raglan, northeast 15 knots, but 25 knots south of Tirua Point. Sea is rough with poor visibility. High tide is at 2.05 in the afternoon. And on the east coast, Bay of Plenty, variable 10 knots, sea slight. High tide is at 11.40 p.m. Coming up in the show, what is the Waikato Spatial Plan? Welcome back to Central News. The Spatial Plan for the Waikato is a collaborative planning framework developed by the Waikato Mural Forum. Paula Southgate and Vaughan Payne explain more. Well, the Waikato Spatial Plan, also known as the Waikato Plan, is a collaborative planning framework that seeks to do two things. Firstly, it brings all the information that we currently have to the table, and that's time-based and spatial-based, location-based information to the table so that we know where we presently sit with a number of issues, resources, people, economy, all of that. And then the second thing it does is plans and maps out a future to deal with some of the really pressing issues that we know we have and that the spatial plan will show us that we have. For example, um, depopulation is one of those, increasing urbanisation is another. Mm -hmm. and, and as we know, the Waikato is very diverse, you know, it extends from, from Taupo in the south um, up to Port Waikato in the north, across including the Coromandel. So it's a very diverse communities in those in those um, areas, but mm. we all face similar similar challenges, whether it's rural depopulation, whether it's environmental issues. So we really need a plan to understand how we're going to approach those similar challenges together and prioritise our investment together. We, we know the benefits of working together through the expressway, but we don't know what the next big um, mm, project is yeah. that we need to work together mm. on that we all benefit from. And, and the ideal is that, that it's, it's projects that aren't limited to, to the economy, but also benefit our environment and our community. So it's, it's, it's really looking for some prioritised investment that have multiple benefits. Yeah. So what you're saying is that you kind of have to predict the future mm -hmm in a sense, in order to establish what to focus on. That's, that's right. So, so mm. we've done a lot of work gathering evidence about what the future might look like mm. for the Waikato, mm -hmm. what challenges it presents to us, and therefore how do we respond to those challenges um, as, as a region, and making sure that we're not uh, working in isolation from our neighbouring regions like Auckland and Bay of Plenty, and are aligning our investment um, with their investment as well. So this is a key piece of work for the Waikato Mayoral Forum. Uh, Vaughan's absolutely right. The Mayoral Forum acknowledged that all of their communities are, are, are experiencing various things. Like we're all getting older, the Waikato population, the New Zealand population, but the Waikato population in particular is getting older. Those people are moving from rural areas to urban areas, so there's depopulation. And that has a lot of flow on impacts around health service delivery, schools, the hot, where you can work and all of that. And we agreed as a mayoral forum that we needed to come together and design a piece of work where we knew what things were like today, could see what they were likely to be tomorrow and we could adapt our responses or frame some solutions because you can't devise solutions until you properly understand the problem. So what the councils throughout the region have done, and there's 10, 10 11 councils, mm. we have formed a joint committee to provide governance for the spatial plan, and we've also had some non-local government members sitting on that committee to help inform um, that, that plan going forward. So it should also provide us with a single voice as a Waikato about where we think we're going to get the best bang for the buck in terms of investment going forward, mm. and, and that single voice 
um, is important in terms of having central government uh, listening to us. If we speak with 10 different voices, then we're not going to be acting in the best interests of our region. Mm. Public consultation closes on Tuesday, the 14th of April. See the council website for more information on how you can submit your feedback. Up next, what is pedagogy and just how exactly are a group of academics from around the world coming together to combine ideas, research and intellect to better our educational system? So um, pedagogy in a sense means the art of or the science of something. So in terms of um, the POET project, it's about the art or the science of educational transitions or the art or the science of children transitioning through school. Okay. And what influences that impact the art of teaching are the poet researchers interested in? Um, it's quite an eclectic bunch of um, people looking at quite different things to be honest. So some people are looking at um, children's academic journeys through school, some, ch uh, some people are looking at um, social and emotional well-being, um, some people are looking at how various cultures move through school um, and particularly in New Zealand that includes um, indigenous or Māori um, culture. So there's, there's quite a few different foci, I guess, between the countries here. Yeah. Yeah. So the researchers from Iceland, Scotland, Sweden, Australia and New Zealand are all coming for a meeting this month. Yes. What is the focus of the meeting? Uh, this month's focus is longitudinal research and particular aspects of that. So longitudinal research is uh, basically research that extends for a period of time um, and that's our focus this time but we're looking at specific aspects within that as well. Yeah. Okay. And what studies have been done that are going to be presented this month? Uh, so there's one team in particular who um, will present um, and, and it's the team leader from Scotland who has done in the past a longitudinal study that tracked children all the way from the start of their school experience right through to when they shifted out of school. So that was quite a major project in Scotland. Um, other teams have done smaller projects and potentially will do some in the future. But we have also a couple of researchers in New Zealand who will come and present and one of those people is um, Kathy Wiley from um, the New Zealand Council of Educational Research. Um, the other person is Polly Carr who is involved in the Growing Up in New Zealand project which is um, looking like it's going to be quite a significant New Zealand longitudinal study eventually. Yeah. So because it's in New Zealand you're able to get in other research researchers from around the country to present? Yeah, so what we're doing um, with Polly for example is she will come for a day and spend a day with us um, and in the morning she'll present, talk about her research, in the afternoon she'll workshop with us so um, we'll, we'll look at our own specific projects and talk about you know some of the issues that we're facing or the way in which we need to set things up and she'll, you know, being an expert will help us with those sorts of things and talk through those sorts of things. Sounds really interesting. Yeah. Now, why these particular countries? Do we have similar teaching practices, school systems? No, we, well, in many ways we do, in lots of ways we don't. Um, and both of those things are actually quite beneficial. So yes, there are lots of commonalities between the way you know, children around the world do school, um, and particularly in, in the countries that we're involved with, which are all Western countries. Um, you know. um, but there are lots of differences. For example, we start school at different ages in each of these countries. And in New Zealand, we start school um, on the day we turn five, generally. Um, in other countries they'll start school in the year that they perhaps turn six or seven. So there are some quite distinct differences, um, but we're learning quite a lot from each other about those differences and sort of thinking about, well, you know, why do we do what we do in our own countries? Yeah. Okay, thank you. We'll be back with more from Nadine after the break. Welcome back to Central News. I'm here with Dr. Nadine Bellum. Nadine, the program started in 2012 and concludes in 2016. What have been some of the challenges along the way? Um, I guess probably one of the biggest challenges would have been to do with funding. So each of the countries involved in the exchange program are funded by different bodies. 
Um, in New Zealand, we're funded by the Royal Society of New Zealand, and we've been quite generously funded. So um, there's provision for four people, basically each exchange, to travel um, to, to different countries and have expenses covered. Um, other countries, for example, Australia, has um, sort of had to seek funding each time they've had to go away. So there've been, you know, a few less people come each time. Um, and the, the European countries are funded by a European body and the, the, you know, the boundaries around their funding is quite different. So sometimes it means that, um, you know, it's a struggle for some people to get to the, the countries twice a year. Um, New Zealand hasn't had too much of a problem with that because of our generous funding, but that has been an issue along the way and it's it's good to have consistency mm. with people coming each time so it's been a little bit of a challenge sometimes when that consistency hasn't necessarily been there um, and not necessarily an issue but it has been a challenge as well has been some of the differences we've struck between the countries so one example of that would be um, New Zealand's quite au fait or quite um, or increasing our knowledge about and increasing our practice of research with um, Māori. Um, and Australia also have quite a, a good understanding, while it's different to our New Zealand understanding of researching with Indigenous people. Um, we've got Scotland and Iceland and Sweden. Sweden have Sami, um, and again, a different relationship with their Indigenous people, but Scotland and Iceland sort of you know, we're struggling with, well, exactly what is Indigenous because we are Indigenous as, you know, as the Western people in this country sort of thing. So, um, yes, so there's been some interesting discussions and things around that. And, and as I say, there haven't been issues, but there have been challenges that we've faced in terms of um, assumptions we've made about the way we research with different people and, and things like that, yeah. And it will sort of expand their own like knowledge and way of thinking as well. Yes, yeah. And so, I mean, even between New Zealand and Australia, we talk about, um, you know, researching by, with and for Māori um, people. But in Australia, one of the issues is that there are not too many Aboriginal researchers at the moment. So to research with, Aboriginal people um, can be a challenge for them. So the by, with and for mantra doesn't particularly um, stand like it does here in New Zealand. So there were some differences there as well, yeah. And what benefits does a collaboration like this provide? Oh, it's, it's really fantastic to be honest because um, I mean, two, two of the key uh, things for Poet, I guess initially was that firstly there would be expertise shared, so there would be a group of people who wouldn't normally work together, um, sharing knowledge and understanding of educational transitions in particular. Um, and the second key point about POET was um, that we would all bring our research to the group um, and be able to input into other people's projects and um, again just have that broader and more global understanding or input into our, our research. So. You know, to, to undertake a, a research project by yourself, you're sort of reliant on what you know and bound by that. But to work in a big group like that is just, it's amazing. Even though the school educational systems differ from country to country, it's always good to look at fresh ideas and examine what works and what doesn't work. And in our last story, weaving the threads of life for a decade now has been tarnished frocks and divas. The date has been set for this year's show, September 16th to the 19th, and the planning and creating for the show is in full swing. So this year we're going to be larger than ever. We're hitting 7,000 tickets to sell. This is bigger than beating her. Hats off to her, I love this name. What's that all about? Okay, that's an open section, part of our open section. This year we've changed it slightly. Instead of having a senior and a junior open section, we're actually doing a construction open section, which is hats off to her. So it's not actually just about making and dressmaking, it's actually about construction. Make a hat to walk on the, hat, on the catwalk uh, the hat needs to be fairly sizeable because remember this is over a thousand per session of audience so it's going to be a large area. That has, hat need needs to be seen from 
every angle. Should we be creating a headpiece or is it strictly hats? Headpiece? Are we talking fascinator here? No. Headpiece is not going to be seen from all the audience, from all of the different advantage points. So it needs to be hat on head. It needs to be able to be worn without aid of holding it on and walking. So a hat is what we're looking for. So there are rules to the competition? Yes, there are, and those can be found online. You also have an Open Design Awards. It's Frolicking Floral Frocks. Apart from a great tongue twister, what is that about? <laughs> so that's part two. That's the other part of the Open section, whereby we had the adult and junior sections previously. We've put it across the board now. So that's the construction, the hat is the construction and the floral frock is actually about dress making. So it's thinking outside the square, thinking about actually wearing that dress within the park. It's a summertime feel, it's actually floral. So that connotates, it brings up a whole lot of other ideas and, the, and images. Get out there, get big with it. Don't just do the small frock, think outside the square, do large, do something that has presence and, and can enter onto that stage and be the wow factor. That's what we're looking for. Constructed out of um, re-loved garments, of course. We're, that's where we go back to that ethos all the time. And the judges will be Marilyn Cleveland, John Beach and Monica Newhouser. Tell me a little bit about them. These are wonderful people. We've got John is actually, he's a local man. He's probably best known for the CEO um, position with, that he held with Garden Arts, Tauranga. Um, we've also got Monica, she's actually a milliner herself, and she's, so she's got that speciality of looking and, and being able to um, see a hat from many strides away, a winner. Um, and then we've got Marilyn, again, she's another local woman. She's actually, her, she has a business here in Tauranga that she operates. She's been within the arts in Tauranga for many years as well. So feel very confident about our judges and our lineup. Visit their website to enter or to volunteer some of your own expertise. Thank you for watching Central News tonight. We do post everything online on our website, tvcentral.co.nz, and we like to keep in touch with our viewers on Facebook. Search centralnews.tv. If you think you might have a story for us, email news at tvcentral.co.nz. We'd always love to hear from you. I'll be back on screens tomorrow with more stories from the Waikato and the Bay of Plenty. My name is Amanda Harper. Have a good night. Ko marie. This has been an Alpha Media Production, a division of Television Media Group. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.